I add um, to Pastor Joel's words of welcome this morning? Glad that you've chosen to be here at Grace Community today. I'm John. I'm one of the pastors here. It's my privilege just to add my personal greeting and welcome to you. Um, and also, before we get started today, I'd like to, another thing that wasn't mentioned in the video. Next Sunday, the very next Sunday that you wake up, is going to be a youth fundraiser lunch here at the church, $9 per person, $40 per family, a pasta buffet. Um, this is a fundraiser lunch to help our students and teenagers with things like mission trip and camp and just all the activities that they do. Uh, so those uh, teenagers who participate in this uh, have an amount of money um, of the proceeds that go into their account to work toward um, being able to go on all the things that the youth group does. So. Uh, make a, a note in your calendar, the QR code to scan there. If you want to uh, enroll right now, we'll excuse you from paying attention for a couple moments while you uh, sign up for that. Uh, Pastor Joel sends his greetings this morning. Uh, we received a text from him this morning saying, hey, we're praying for Grace Community, and we know that he is and uh, that they would love to be here with us today. <clears throat> well, um, it had to be a God thing. Um, my name uh, was and largely still is kind of uh, basically unknown in this tribe that we call the Church of the Nazarene. So there was no reason for him, no reason whatsoever for him to, to take an interest in the young pastor who was appointed to pastor the small struggling church in Hickory Hills, Illinois, a small south suburb in Chicago. But by the providence of God, our first little church was located in the suburb right next door to the suburb where he lived, and he walked through the doors for a Sunday morning worship service <clears throat> not long after we arrived there. He introduced himself as Bob. His name was Dr. Robert Serrato. He was an impressive, imposing, um, elderly, or so I thought at the time, I, I d actually did some math um, this week and realized that he was just two or three years older than I am now, and I thought he was elderly at the time, so a kind of little, little sobering. Uh, elderly gentleman, he simply shook my hand, complimented my message, and walked out the door. But then surprisingly, he returned a couple weeks later, and, and once again, he, he shook my hand and said kind, encouraging words to me as he walked out the door after the service that morning. And, and finally, one day, not long uh, after that, um, he, he stopped by the church on a weekday to, to find me uh, in my office. And he sat down with me in, in, in my office for a little while, and we just got to know each other in just a delightful, encouraging conversation. And throughout the course of time, I learned more and more about him as I learned people who knew, as I uh, talked to people who, who knew him. I found out he was a, a decorated veteran of World War II. He was a distinguished um, Nazarene missionary, a prominent pastor in the denomination, a district superintendent both internationally and domestically. I, I didn't know whether to be petrified the more I uh, learned about him or uh, in, in, you know, kind of such the presence of such a legend or just, just grateful that he seemed to be interested in this young rookie pastor. I chose the latter. And throughout my years of service there, he frequented our church service. He periodically left generous monetary gifts both to the church and to this young pastor who made a whopping $225 a week in my first pastorate. He learned of my skills in construction, and occasionally he invited me to help him work on his rental properties that were kind of scattered around the suburbs. They needed various repairs and maintenance now and then, and we'd just make a morning of working together. Our relationship grew and it became rich and it was a friendship, it was reciprocal. We'd work together sometimes, sometimes we'd just go out to breakfast or coffee and just talk about life and church and family and Jesus and ministry. And he told me that he really believed in what we were doing at the church. And, and he told me he'd like to underwrite the cost of a professionally printed brochure about the ministry of Hickory Hills Church. He told me pretty much exactly what the brochure should look like. And insisted that it, uh, that it have a, a picture of the young pastor of the church, which of course gave me an uncomfortable, cringy feeling. But I guess it was just the way marketing was done in his day, and it was long before the Google, so, you know, uh, what did I know? I just, I, I complied. 
Oh, in our conversations, he'd give me insights into little things that came up at the church where I needed advice. And as we spent time together and our friendship was developing, he shared practical advice of all manner, including the advice to not count on our so-called pension uh, for retirement. I'm uh, sure glad I listened to him on that one. His mentorship, mentorship was just an absolute godsend. So evident was the hand of God in bringing him across my path that it even, it even extended into our son's kindergarten experience. Um, my son was a bit of a challenge when he was little. Um, in fact, so often for the first seven or eight years, I just, I just would turn to Laura and just apologize. I'm, I'm sorry you have to be involved in raising my son, just very, very much my son. If you'd meet him now, you'd experience one of the most laid-back, easygoing guys you ever wanted to know. But when he was in preschool, um, he had his 50-something-year-old veteran preschool teacher just curled up in a ball and completely befuddled as to how to handle her, handle him. And his kindergarten teacher experienced a similar student when he arrived in her classroom. But thankfully, unbeknownst to us, his kindergarten teacher, Mrs. Crestel, was the daughter of Dr. Robert Serrato. And, and, and it really, that, all that wasn't known until this story I'm telling started to unfold. She was at her breaking point with our little overactive guy. And finally, she decided to go to the office and pull his file, expecting to see in his file that he's a child of a train wreck home with drug, drug addicts as parents. She was a bit surprised to learn that, like herself, he was actually a Nazarene pastor's kid and probably would have been her second guess. <laughs> so I guess she told her dad about it one day and Dr. Serrato inquired about the child's last name. Tater, she replied. So he told her about his relationship with me and thankfully kind of elevated her perception of the likely home situation of this very overactive kindergartner. And by the time Mrs. Crestel called us, she had decided to alter course in her recommendation. Instead of going through with a recommendation uh, for an evaluation and a probable drug regimen for the child, she decided to try just to keep him a bit busier and more challenged. And she wondered if perhaps she was, he was just a, a little bit uh, bright and bored, the, the bright part that he was Laura's son, too. Um, we, we assured her of our full support from home, and by the time parent-teacher conference rolled around, she reported that our little Stephen was becoming a model kindergarten student. And as I was thinking about that, I thought, oh, the value of just God-ordained mentorship relationships within his family and amongst his people. Almost 35 years later, I still recall Dr. Serrato's impact on my life as a young rookie pastor and the way he came alongside me and was there for me during those years in Chicago. This morning, our Becoming the Best You series calls us to look at the character of Timothy. We've been looking at the people in the Apostle Paul's life who helped him become the very best version of himself, and we've seen the value of having people in your life who encourage you, who befriend you, who challenge you, who are willing to risk for you. And this morning we learn about the great value of mentorship, both being a mentor and being mentored in the things of Christ. So let's get to know Timothy for just a bit. He's mentioned 19 times in the New Testament outside of the letters known as 1st and 2nd Timothy written directly to him. And so we first meet Timothy in Acts chapter 16 verses 1 and 2 simply says this, Paul came to Derbe and then to Lystra where a disciple named Timothy lived whose mother was Jewish and a believer but whose father was a Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. So this was during Paul's second missionary journey, and Timothy, simply introduced to us as a disciple, had an exceptional reputation among local Christians. It simply says in the scripture, they spoke well of him. The brothers spoke well of him. Now, commentators, um, not necessarily related to me, although I am a commentator, 
I, and I know at some, at this point in a lot of my messages, to some of you I become something of an irritator. But I, but I only do this kind of thing to bring a little bit of levity. So you might consider me a levitator as well. I'll stop now, I think, which also makes me a hesitator and a cogitator. Um, <laughs> these things go on and on. For, for 40 years, Laura and I have thought of names for our children. I digress far too often. As I started to say, commentators surmise that Timothy's mother and grandmother perhaps became disciples during Paul's first missionary journey, and that Timothy likely knew nothing other than the life of discipleship. In 2 Timothy 1 verse 5, Paul recognizes young Timothy's great faith as something that first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. You know, when I think of that, um, it causes me to stop and just kind of add something that will be in parentheses here. I would contend that perhaps it's one of the greatest treasures of life when you're raised in a godly home and literally know nothing other than a life of discipleship. It's why I love our, our excellent children and youth ministry here at Grace Community where families can live in partnership with the godly teaching of our youth and children, pastors uh, Brandon and Margaret. We, and we, we learn, granted, from amazing stories in the Bible that God can rescue and heal and deliver people from the most sordid lives of, of sin and brokenness. And if that's your story, welcome to the way of Jesus. We applaud the amazing grace that's being poured into your brokenness, bringing about salvation and new life where you need it and when you need it. In fact, we applaud that so effectively that sometimes I fear we run the risk of overlooking the also amazing grace that is so subtly poured into the Christian home. A grace that need not rescue perishing children, but rather protects them from the damage that the enemy wants to do in every single life. I actually recall a time when I just about wished I would have, have lived a, a life of blatant rebellion and, and evil and brokenness, at least for a while, so that I'd have a better, more dramatic story of, of my conversion and of God's deliverance in my life. But I've come to learn that God gave me a treasured gift when, he's, when he saved my parents. And, and my parents did their absolute best to guide me into a life of following Jesus from the very time that I was born. And I didn't do it perfectly. No one does. But I was the recipient of such a gift when I was fortunate enough to be born to those parents. <clears throat> Let's put it this way. I had to work a lot harder at doing damage to my life than other kids do. I still managed to do a lot of stupid things. But thanks be to God... All that damage was minimized because of the protective shelter of godly parents and churches who prayed for me and guided me and instructed me and put me in relationship with others who were followers of Jesus Christ. You see, we really do need each other. I'm convinced that the role we play in one another's lives in the church, in grow groups, in, in, in youth group, in children's ministries, in uh, families doing life together, in the home as parents, it's truly in, in, invaluable when it comes to paving the way for our children to come to Christ. And we find out that Timothy was one such person, a third generation follower of Jesus here right in the very first years after Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. So moving on now and discovering more about Timothy and his place in Paul's life and this relationship that they had, in Romans 16, 21, in his letter to the Roman church, Paul sends greetings identifying Timothy as his co-worker. Timothy, my co-worker, sends his greetings to you. So we get that picture of Timothy just by Paul's side doing the work of evangelism that Paul was called to do and did so effectively. In Philippians 2, 22, but you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. Timothy showed himself to be dependable. He proved himself as a worthy um, a co-worker of, of Paul's. He's mentioned by Paul as his co-author in the New Testament letters to the Corinthian church, the Philippian church, and the Thessalonian church. Throughout the New Testament, he's sent by Paul as an emissary to proclaim 
Paul's message of Christ, when Paul couldn't be there himself, he would, he would send Timothy in his stead to do the work of preaching the gospel. So we see that Timothy, though a young mentee of Paul, he was also by his own right a reputable, dependable, trusted confidant of that very mentor. And that's the dance of mentorship. A truly uh, beneficial relationship is mutually beneficial, and that's the way good mentorship is. I suspect that if Timothy was made to feel like a low-ranking underling gopher of Paul, the relationship would have turned out much differently. But this beautiful model of a healthy mentorship relationship instead serves as a stellar example of um, reciprocity and friendship and mutual value to both parties. It's a relationship of love, a relationship of respect, a, a relationship of, of care. And so it, it leads us to a question when we consider mentorship this morning. Who do you truly care about? And this talks to us about a willingness in our lives to be or become a mentor, to let someone look at our life and let someone walk with us and let someone do the co-laboring in the work of Christ. And, it's, and, it, and it comes from truly caring about someone and loving someone enough to pour into their lives. Listen to these terms of endearment and care in Paul's writing as he describes Timothy in 1 Corinthians 4, 17. For this reason I have sent you, Timothy, my son whom I love who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way in the life of Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. Colossians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. Introducing Timothy to the Colossian church as he is our brother in Christ. He is dear to us. In 2 Timothy, or 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2, to Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. And, and this is just a smattering of the sentiment found in Paul's mention of Timothy throughout the New Testament. The language used in describing the relationship of Paul and Timothy is that of profound love and concern and care. And I'm not talk, just talking about warm, fuzzy sentiment, that element of love that often comes to mind when we hear the word, hear the word love. But Paul genuinely loved Timothy <clears throat> as a son. I just spent last weekend with my only son and his family as we went to visit them in Loveland, Colorado. So no one needs to describe that love to me. It's a deep and profound love. It's, it's a completely selfless desire for the well-being of him and his family. It's a relationship where we can, we can exchange ideas freely with one another, knowing that even if we disagree, which any two adults would on given fine points of any subject, even if we disagree on fine points here and there, we genuinely want the very best for one another, and we're willing to listen to one another and exchange ideas into one another, and it is so valued. The lion's share of this message series has been to demonstrate the importance of beneficial spiritual relationships, and most of the examples so far have focused on people who had built into the Apostle Paul's life. They built into the development of Paul as the great hero of the New Testament that he is and, and helped him become that hero of the way of Christ. It's all been designed to show us the truth that if we're going to become the very best versions of ourselves, we will, we will not be self-made. We'll have somebody along the way with us. And today in our study of Timothy, we find Paul kind of full circle and in the thick of, of investing his, his life in this, this young protege, Timothy. And it's more than the routine relationship of a student and teacher. It's a rich, life-giving exchange of relationship and friendship. And thus, we find Paul continuing in the process of becoming his very best self in his willing to build into the life of another. And it made both of them better. 
And in considering Timothy, there's a second question that we want to consider this morning in the context of mentorship. Not only who do you truly care about and are you willing to do the work of mentorship in the life of somebody you love and care about, or are, and, but are you willing to receive care? Uh, do you have a willingness to be taught, to be mentored, to have someone come alongside you, to, to listen in as someone lives with you? We have volumes of instructional material from Paul to Timothy. And in order for this to be a beneficial relationship, Timothy has to be receptive to all of that instructional material. And by every indication, Timothy eagerly welcomed Paul's teaching and direction and allowed it to enrich his life and ministry. The entirety of, of Paul's two letters to Timothy are instructional words for his own personal spiritual benefit as well as for the task of pastoring churches um, and, and very detailed instructions on how to lead in the affairs of the church. The, the uh, book, the letter called 1 Timothy is mostly about um, his, his uh, instruction in leading a church and pastoring a church. The letter that we call 2 Timothy is, is the one that's more personal and gives more personal guidance and more personal mentorship. 2 Timothy 1 verses 3 through 7 is a great place to look into this. I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did, Paul said, with a clear conscience as night and day. I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. And I'm persuaded that now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the Spirit of God does not, give, it does not make us timid, but it gives us power and love and self-discipline. One of the commentators uh, uh, that I read, I, th I think it was William Barclay that had a little heading uh, about this passage that simply said, God has no grandchildren. Paul reminds Timothy, your Christian grandmother and mother are not enough. You need to fan into flame your own spiritual life. You're responsible that the fire doesn't go out in your life. Our family did a lot of camping when we were growing up. We actually owned campers for the vast majority of our children's childhood, and we'd run off for a little one- and two-day getaways, and sometimes we'd take it on vacation even. And so our memories are full of the beauty of a quiet evening of laughter and stories and s'mores around the campfire. And as you know, if you've ever seen a fire, Fires have a tendency to die if they're just left alone. And so we'd sit around and we'd be laughing. We'd take a break to do this or that. And we'd come back to the fire ring and realize that the fire was about to go out. And one of the kids would say, let's, let's get it going again. And so they knew how to run out and they'd grab the kindling and, and they'd ask dad to kind of poke around in the, in the fire a little bit and do what it takes to fan it back into flame. And, and it makes us ask ourselves this morning, do you have anyone in your life that reminds you to rearrange the fuel, to put another log on the fire so that a healthy flame is reignited? That's what Paul was in Timothy's life, just somebody who reminded him, don't let the fire go out. And Timothy seems to have a track record of willingly receiving the mentorship given to him in this great leader named Paul. Paul encouraged Timothy also to persevere, to stay with it, to keep the long view in mind. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through, 1 through 9, it says this, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard from me say in the presence of many witnesses and entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. So just as I'm mentoring you, mentor others who will mentor others who will mentor others. This is mentor, meant to do us good and to go on and to do others good as long as Christendom exists. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. 
And the hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. And then, <clears throat> remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel for which I'm suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word, the truth, is not chained. This is the call to be strong and to persevere and to stick with it and remember that you've got to have the long view. You see, the unfortunate thing about many people when they tr begin to follow Christ is they just, they just quit too soon. And, and so uh, Paul is reminding Timothy like a soldier, listen to your commanding officer, stay in the fight, don't get sidetracked by civilian affairs like an athlete, train in the fundamentals of the game and you'll know better than to cut corners and you'll know better than to cheat because you can't win if you cheat. Like a farmer faithfully planting and cultivating and doing the work with a focus only on the harvest. Paul also encouraged Timothy to, to tightly grasp the core truth of the gospel. Listen, remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel. This is the good news that I've trained you to teach. Paul knew and wanted Timothy to know that if this truth of a resurrected Jewish Messiah was really true, then everything Jesus taught was true and right, and his way is definitely the way. This crucial truth of the resurrection of Christ has impacted the whole of human history. The, the story is told of a, a man and his wife and his mother-in-law who went on vacation to the Holy Land. While, we were there, while they were there, his, his mother-in-law passed away. The undertaker told him, you can bury her here in the Holy Land for $150, or you can have her body shipped home for $5,000. The man thought about it and informed the undertaker they'd just have to have her shipped home. The undertaker questioned him in puzzlement and said, why would you spend $5,000 to ship her body home when it would be so beautiful to have her buried in the Holy Land and spend only $150? The man replied, a man died here 2,000 years ago. He was buried here, and three days later he rose from the dead, and I just can't take that chance. Okay, that's fun. Like I said, you know, levitator. Maybe not even perfectly placed, but it just had to be said. I don't want us to miss the point as we're laughing. Our truth is a con consequential truth. It is of utmost importance to receive and guard and convey this life-giving way of Jesus. And good mentorship helps us do that. Sadly, in my years of following Jesus, I've seen far too many people stray from the truth because they were just lone wolves. They didn't have anyone to remind them of the truth. We really do need mentorship and accountability if we're to adhere carefully in the, over the long haul to the core truth of the gospel and the way of following Jesus. <clears throat> so let's, let's wrap things up this morning. Somebody told me... Um, decades ago now, when I was in the early years of my pastoral work. John, you should always have a Paul in your life, and you should always have a Timothy in your life. And that was good advice. I've tried to live in that advice. I, I've tried to always identify people that I can learn from and just slow down and, and take time to listen to them. And I've also always tried to recognize that there are people, whether I like it or not, people learning from me and watching me um, work out my salvation. And as I've aged, I've learned that the lines in mentorship blur. <laughs> and I've enjoyed many relationships where I've learned so much from people both younger and older than I, and that is chronological age and spiritual age. I, I almost love it when I just have the opportunity to be around like a brand new Christian 
because they have such refreshing insight and such refreshing um, just life in their, and, and gratitude in their eyes. And frankly, I don't know when or how this aging thing really, really happens in life. It sneaks up. Dr. J.K. Warwick, retired general, general superintendent of the Church of the Nazarene, talks about when he was a younger pastor, he would make mistakes and people would respond to him, that's all right, you're young. You just didn't know better. And years went by, and one day when he did something that didn't measure up, he noticed the response had changed. He would hear people instead say, I can't believe you did something so foolish. You're old enough to know better. And it flummoxed him as he wondered, when did I cross that imaginary line? <clears throat> when and where do our relationships change from mentor to mentee? Might I suggest that our lives are generally in a, a constant state of, of both. And that's good, and that's the way it should be. Life is a messy, beautiful mix of constant giving and receiving care and teaching and learning. So I recall an incident in my life that dramatically illustrates this. For about um, eight plus years in one of my previous ministry assignments, Laura and I served as a just kind of in a perpetual rotation of classes for engaged and newlywed couples. Week after week, we would pour into the lives of young couples doing all the premarital counseling for that ministry and having these weekly classes, and Laura would attend showers for these young brides, and we would attend the weddings and host parties in our home, and we'd visit their newborn babies, and occasionally we'd be called by a couple or two to do some counseling through some of that kind of early rough water that marriages can experience. We just, we just loved them. And we tried to just be there for them. We just tried to be that voice in their lives. And frankly, they, in, throughout those years, they became our dear friends. We would perform some of their marriage ceremonies and, and just lived with them. Well, as the years elapsed, our ministry to the engaged and newlywed couples, it turned over a number of times as couples would graduate to the next stage of life and new couples would enter this newlywed chapter. Um, and it came to pass, which I often say that's one of my favorite scriptures in the old King James Version uh, uh, scriptures, and it came to pass, because sometimes when something happens in your life, the best thing about it is that it came to pass. So it came to pass that the ministry I was serving at the time determined that some downsizing was necessary. Indebtedness had done its magic, and things in general were just contracting and and I found myself a casualty of that downsizing. So for those of you who don't follow the way I speak, that's just a nice way of saying I got let go. And that experience put me in a place where I, that I'd never been. Um, and amongst a plethora of unknown dynamics was the prospect of being without a paycheck for the first time since I was a young teenager. It was heavy and a difficult time. And one evening shortly after it happened, I received a text from one of the guys who had been in our newlywed class some years before, and they were very dear to us. He asked if we were home, and I told him we were, and a few minutes later, he showed up at our house. He got out of his truck and walked up to our door and greeted us with just a huge hug. He expressed his gratitude for all the times that we'd been there for him and his family. And he handed me this fat envelope. We hugged him and thanked him for their dear friendship. And when we opened the envelope after they left, we discovered 25 $20 bills. And I got it. At that moment, after all the years of being Paul to him, caring for him and his family, he recognized that it was time to be Paul to us. And he poured care into our lives when we needed it the most. Mentorship is a reciprocal gift of relationship in the body of Christ. It's the constant and ongoing process of giving and receiving value and benefit and care into one another's lives. And it all reinforces once again my dear mentor's words from decades ago. John, you should always have a Paul in your life. And you should always have a Timothy in your life. 
And so I give the same advice this morning to us, and I ask two questions as we close. Who is your Paul, or will you find one? And who is your Timothy? Are you willing to find one? And these are the questions that mentorship offer us to answer.